Um, but we'll get started. Uh, right, yeah, cheers for coming down. Um, I'll just say a few things about Steve Higginson who's speaking today. Um, we met Steve a few years ago through some odd connections. The bookshop's obviously called The Hydra. And uh, if you look on this bookmark, it says something like The Hydra, a many headed beast born of a typhoon. A hurricane, whatever. And Echidna, a half woman, half snake, was a powerful image of revolt during the rise of capitalism in the 17th and 18th centuries. So um, the reason the bookshop has a connection to why we know Steve, really, the bookshop's named after the Hydra because the Hydra was a symbol of all the revolts that appeared in the 17th and 18th centuries as Hercules, the symbol of uh, merchant classes, kind of colonised the new world and uh, exploited millions, if not tens of millions of people in the process. But all through that time, there were revolts by sailors and indentured labourers, slaves, obviously Caribbean slave revolts, and all across that Atlantic world there were, there were revolts. And the Hydra represents that, because every time the merchant classes and their armies and their East India companies and, and all, all the sort of mechanisms for exploiting that new world, not just in South America, North America and across the Caribbean, every time they tried to put down a revolt, another one sprang up somewhere else. So that's where the symbol of the Hydra comes from. And you may have not seen this book, if you're interested to write, called The Many-Headed Hydra, which is where the, we learned about this. So I definitely recommend that text, because it had a massive influence on in starting that Bristol Radical History Group. That book was written by, by uh, Peter Leinbaum and Marcus Redeker, two American historians who um, we spoke to very early on when Bristol Radical History Group was forming. Uh, basically, we spoke to Marcus Redeker, who's an expert on piracy and maritime what they call the maritime hierarchy, like a, a kind of the kind of the revolt that went on amongst sailors and other maritime workers in that period. And we wrote to him in, in 2005 when we were first thinking about doing some events around the radical history of the Atlantic in Bristol. And he said um, he was very supportive. Um, he said, "Yeah, do it, do it, do it, do it. You know, this is a good idea. You know, you, Bristol's perfectly placed because it's a port city, as is Liverpool." Another port city was certainly involved in the transatlantic slave trade. So um, he was very, very positive about it. But one of the things he said was, he said, we need to speak to this group in Liverpool that we came across a few years ago, uh, involved in the Writing on the Wall Collective. And, and they put us in touch with him and said, talk to, the, talk, to our, uh, talk to our people we know in Liverpool, because they're on the same track. They're looking at this, this kind of uh, outside the nation understanding of history. So kind of going against the idea of, say, British history, but looking instead at the history of, say, the Atlantic proletariat. There's huge numbers of people moving across the Atlantic, whether it's West African slaves, or whether it's indentured labourers, or whether it's sailors or soldiers, you know, developing the new world. And all of those people were involved in revolts against that system. So we talked to Right on the Wall, and that was the way we got in touch with Steve, who was one of the people who was involved in some of that work. Uh, I think that was probably in 2006, that's how we got to know Steve. Um, since then, Steve's come down and done several talks, particularly on time, work, labour, discipline, his, his relationship to port cities and how they're different, how there's different kinds of, say, political and social behaviours in those cities. I mean, some people are, I mean, I, I would say that, I don't know what you think about this, but one of the most spine or hair raising moments in my life was watching uh, the FA Cup final after the Hillsborough tragedy, um, as you might remember back in uh, 1989. Yeah. And um, in that cup final, I remember you know, usually a singer abide with me, and then the national anthem, or the national anthem then abide with me. And the national anthem began on that FA Cup final in 1989. The Liverpool fans drowned it out. In fact, the whole, everybody there drowned it out by singing You'll Never Walk Alone. And I was interpreted that as something about Liverpool, which is the fact that Liverpool, as Steve has argued, is not really part of Britain. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's certainly within that framework of looking outside the idea of national histories and, in fact, looking at what actually happens, the movements of people and the movements of culture across the Atlantic. So that's, how, that's what Steve's talked about in the past. But uh, now, uh, tonight, I mean, I, I just put you in context of what's been going on this year. About a year or so ago, we talked a lot about about 2011 being the anniversary of 100 years since the strikes in Liverpool in 1911. Um, 
some of the groups across the country involved in radical history have been involved in a bit of Churchill fashion. We certainly have, because we'd like to take the iconic image of Churchill apart and really expose perhaps what the real history of Winston Churchill is, and obviously a connection to the 1911 Olympics, which Steve, I imagine, will mention. Um, so we've been involved over the last couple of years, and in Liverpool they've been running a series of events being an outline about the history of 1911, which is an iconic, iconic Liverpool history. So I know there's been an awful lot of controversy about this new history, and Steve's going to kind of outline some of the work he's been doing on 1911 and some of the new perspectives which have created a consternation in different quarters and in the history groups of Liverpool. So I'm just going to hand over now. All right, thanks, thanks a lot, Rog. Um, but first off, uh, on behalf of um, the people who've been running these series of events back in Liverpool, we are absolutely delighted to come down here and speak at the um, the opening of the Hydra bookshop. We really are, you know, it's uh, probably the highlight of what we've been taking uh, around Liverpool, uh, having this gig down in Bristol. Um, 1911. Iconic year in Liverpool. For four months, the city was under martial law. Gunboats were moored on the Mersey because of a strike of dock workers, seafarers, and railwaymen. Now, Church, Winston Churchill, um, a month into the dispute, um, in reply to a question in the House of Commons, uh, made this statement, you need not attach any great importance to the rioting in Liverpool last night. It took place in an area where disorder is a chronic feature. And um, I must admit, I don't often, well I never agree with Winston Churchill, but he got it right on that, uh, that quote. Um, now, what's taken place over the last 12 months in Liverpool is um, very, very conventional in terms of the history of Liverpool 1911. Um, we started doing some research back in January because really the conventional history of 1911 is very, uh, there's too many loose ends, too many yawning gaps, and there's some huge paradoxes which have never ever been resolved. Now, Conventional Labour history and radical history would say that what took place in Liverpool in 1911 was a syndicalist revolt. That's what they put it down to. But it's quite bizarre, if you want to call it a syndicalist revolt, then when you have a look at the demands of dockers, seafarers and railwaymen, their central demand, according to their trade unions, was for the government to mediate between labour and capital, what they call conciliation and arbitration boards. Now I would argue that that is about as far removed from syndicalism as you can get, because syndic syndicalism to me my reading of revolutionary syndicalism at its core was always to smash the state, not bring the state as a mediator into um, industrial life. The, um, the other aspect of, um, well it's quite a, a huge contradiction, is the fact that again conventional radical history in Liverpool and elsewhere has seen it, what took place in 1911, as being down to a couple of trade union leaders. The leadership of Tom Mann, the leadership of the Dockers leader, James Sexton. Now, the problem we had with that was because when we started looking at government papers of 1911, the government were very, very concerned because they said the disputes have gotten out of control, 
the men will not listen to their leaders and a young group of new and unknown leaders have sprung up. So what we started looking at to try and um, um, look at these contradictions is really what was really going on in 1911. So what we did when we started writing about it, we came to realise that 1911 is the year that Joe Hill writes the great labour movement anthem, you'll get pie in the sky when you die. 1911 was when the Mexican Revolution broke out with Zapata. Um, 1911 was when the first art of Pablo Picasso arrived in Liverpool. 1911 was also where Liverpool became the base of a group of radical educationalists who were all anarchists. And what we decided to do in looking at 1911, we came to the conclusion that you can't separate what was taking place industrially from what was happening culturally, artistically, musically, and a whole other plethora of art forms. Uh, we've always argued our politics is basically the working <coughs> class are always far more than just the job role. There's always far more attached to uh, working class people than just uh, work. So we, what we started looking at first off is the transatlantic influences of 1911. And if you can think that in 1910, over 120,000 Liverpool seafarers shipped out to America, New York, on a transatlantic run. 120,000. That many, in fact, that the seafarers union leader, a fella called Havelock Wilson, to try and prepare for a seafarer's strike, had to spend six months in America trying to marshal his own union membership. Didn't spend six months in this country, six months in America, because that was where they were. Then what we came across was, um, The fact that all these Liverpool seafarers had docked, jumped ship in America. And at that time, the union organiser for um, the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, who was working the Brooklyn docks and the New York docks, was a wonderful woman of colour called Lucille Parsons. She was working alongside um, James Connolly, famous Irish agitator. And we started to argue that if you've got 120,000 seafarers who jump ship in New York, then it beggars belief that you would argue that they wouldn't have come under some kind of influence of Lucille Parsons, James Connolly, and the industrial workers of the world, the IWW. Because again, we, uh, we tend to forget that in 1905, when the IWW was founded, one of the signatories to the IWW was James Connolly. And Connolly ends up, in 1911, working on the Belfast docks, the same time the Liverpool dispute had broken out, Belfast and Dublin break out as well. So what we started to try and do is to make all these connections. That rather than see it, 1911, as being a um, dispute linked to this group of English trade union leaders, there was far more um, transatlantic influences, if you like, at play. What kicks off the dispute? Well, this is where, and I think it's the same with any revisionist history, um, 
this has caused quite a fury back on Merseyside. The reasons that we've said the dispute broke out. Um, the furthest meeting that I've shouted down, being called a heretic, a dissenter, the soul of seeds of dissent, which uh, I made up about really. <laughs> <laughs> that's who I am and that's what I've done always. Anyway, so it makes no difference. I'm de delighted with those um, labels. Um, <coughs> the dispute doesn't break out in Liverpool. It actually starts in Southampton. And the reason why it starts, and um, the radical, Bristol Radical History Group have heard me speak on umpteen occasions about this question of time and industrial time. It starts off at Southampton Docks. And we must remember that, you know, a hundred years ago, the majority of workers on the docks were casual. What takes place in Southampton is five, five workers are told to attend for work at six o'clock in the morning. They attend for work and they're told there's a log jam in the dock, therefore you'll have to hang round and we'll call you back when you're required. They were called back at 11 o'clock. However, this day, what they said was, well look, you've kept us waiting from 6 to 11. We want paying for that. That in itself was quite a revolutionary demand. They said, these five individuals said, we want paying for that time, 6 to 11. And they were out on strike for five hours. In the end, the employer conceded and the ships um, started to leave Southampton. But in the meantime, what they had secured in Southampton had spread to Liverpool. Because basically it's the same in any industrial dispute. If one group of workers get something, another group will say, well, we want some of that as well. So the same demands that took place in Southampton were then being applied in Liverpool. And there's two, two particular reasons for that. Is that transatlantic liners um, were getting quicker and quicker and quicker. In fact, 1911 saw the Mauritania, the transatlantic run Liverpool to New York and back, it broke the world speed record. But on those ships, the workforce are being expected to work, work quicker and quicker. When the ship docks, the dockers are expected to work quicker and quicker because they've got to turn it round and get it back out on the outgoing tide. Now, we would argue, and we do argue, that, that what we were seeing what we see in 1911 is the birth of speed up capitalism, which we're living, you know, we would argue, and we might have a debate about this later on, the epitome of that is the age that we live in today, where everything's instantaneous. We don't have any time or space, everything's compressed into the instant. So, all what um, Frederick Winslow Taylor had written about in 1911, he was the, the father figure of time and motion, whereby every little movement of a worker was being timed and broken down on a production line, basically to turn groups of workers into robots. And that's what was happening on the ship and on the docks. And that is the core element, really, of the revolt that took place. And what's very, very interesting is that, again, um, some of the, the people we've upset back in Liverpool, um, the two people I worked with on this project, 
we've got a combined level of trade union. We were, we were all, we've all been trade union, shop stewards and trade union officials. What we did, we went through all the agreements that 1911 um, secured. And um, it was quite clear that what 1911 was about was time. Because every one of the agreements covering seafarers, dockers and railway are to do with this element of work time. So if you're a casual worker and you're told to turn up at six in the morning and there's no work for you, you will be paid from six o'clock in the morning, irrespective of whether there's any work for you. If you're told to turn in on a Saturday and Sunday, you won't be classed. That, those days will not be classed as normal working days. You will be paid overtime, double time, and in some cases, treble time. So we've got this whole um, construct of time which is uh, enveloping um, Liverpool at the it's quite embarrassing when you read some of the, the comments from the trade union leaders at the time because their, their particular argument with the employers, and this is where we've always got to differentiate between what trade union leaders are saying and what the rank and file are saying because there was a massive gap in 1911 um, in terms of what the leaders were saying and what the rank and file were saying. And that's why it took so long to get the workforces back to work. That's why it ran on and on and on for nearly four months across that long, hot summer. Um, the other element, which I touched on before, that we can't separate from what was going on the docks. Um, I've seen as a... I think there's a book here by a Brazilian educationist, Paulo Freire, The Pedagogy, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And that, that is basically, um, Freire developed this concept of anyone who works in education today, it's either called active learning, student-centered learning, or experiential learning. Um, yeah, it wasn't Freire who came up with that concept. A group of anarchists in Liverpool in 1911, <coughs> a wife and a partner, uh, uh, Nelly and James Dick, also um, another anarchist called Leonard Abbott, they had set up in Liverpool in 19, from 1908 what was called the Modern School Movement. The Modern School Movement was based on the teachings of a Barcelona, Barcelonian anarchist Francisco Ferrer who was um, assassinated by uh, the authorities in um, Barcelona in, um, in, that same, in that same year. So Liverpool from 1908 onwards had this thriving, independent, anarchistic um, form of education. And what's, what's What's very, very important to note, James and Ellie Dick and Leonard Abbott sailed to New York in 1912 and there they set up the biggest modern school movement the world has ever seen. So big that the great, well, American philosopher and educationist, John Dewey, it was at that school where he got all his influences from. Um, but even though they sailed to New York in 1912, their, their influences are still felt in Liverpool today. And quite simply, those influences are that Liverpool has a history of um, from the 1960s onwards, when, it, when local authorities have tried to shut schools down, uh, the north, the south, the east and the west of Liverpool. Um, we've seen this development where communities rise up 
and refuse the authorities the opportunity to close them. The last one was a comprehensive school in Croxteth, which is an outlying district in Liverpool, that is now called the Croxteth Community. It's a university within the community. Wonderful, wonderful place of learning, um, cultural, uh, artistical, uh, and it's still still going strong today. Um, and that was because the co community said, "No, you're not closing that. That is the focal point of our community." So there's a history there of um, people um, refusing to accept what education authorities say and lo local government, keeping control of their own schools and education, which you can trace back to this great anarchist tradition in Liverpool from 1908 uh, onwards. Um, another interesting point about 1911. Any, any of you been to Liverpool at all? Have you ever been down to the waterfront? Liverpool's waterfront is, uh, after New York, it's the most well-known waterfront in the world because it's, it's dominated by three major buildings called the Three Graces. And what's interesting is that the architecture who designed those buildings and his students, he was in charge of Liverpool School of Architecture from 1904 onwards, a fellow called Charles O'Reilly. And it, it, it's just interesting to note that when we start talking about all these uh, cross transatlantic influences in politics and culture, um, there was also these wonderful influences of architecture as well. Because Riley was going backwards and forwards to New York to have a look at how New York's waterfront fitted in with the city itself. And then he came back to Liverpool with a wonderful comment that says, river cities should always reflect the river. So they should be built, you know, alongside of and apart from <coughs> the river. It's to reflect that, that aesthetic of why river cities are different. So he, he, he was very, very important. I've mentioned Picasso and but alongside Picasso, there was the first showing in Great Britain of what we now know as the post-impressionist movement, the revolution in art. Uh, in art. Cezanne, Gauguin, Matisse, Van Gogh, that was shown at the Blue Coat Chambers in Liverpool in, in 1911. And again, when you have a look at those forms of revolutionary art, you can see what those particular artists were rejecting. And we would say that they, just like dockers and seafarers, were rejecting tailorism and work study and the, um, this obsession with converting the human body into a piece of clockwork that Matisse, Gauguin, Suzanne, Picasso were also rejecting in their particular areas of art that very same mechanical, robotic way of painting and drawing. Can I just ask a question? You know when you're talking about this time in between um, 1908 and 1911 or 12 in Liverpool, yeah. um, and the people who were involved in it, I would just be interested to know what your research has thrown up about how much the... Um, Afro-Caribbean, the Chinese and the Irish diasporas that were in Liverpool then, how much of those communities were also involved? Or was it predominantly the English working class who were... Um, I know that, you know, it's just, I'd just be quite interested to know, were they, did they perceive themselves as people do now in Liverpool? They perceive themselves as Liverpudlians rather than English people. You know, they first of all think of themselves as Liverpudlians. Did that happen then? It, it's just I've got a history. My dad was a Liverpudlian, and you know, my family were from Liverpool. 
So I just sort of um, just interested to know about that time, whether people thought of themselves as Liverpudlians or. No, you're quite right, really, because the the dock strike that occurred was kicked off in the north end of Liverpool docks. What Eric Hobsbawm, in a very derisory comment, wrote off of just call them Irish Catholics. Yeah. So he never gave any credence to that union. The south end of the docks were the rigidly English. Protestant skilled dock workers, carters, and and there were still major tensions between the two. Yeah. But it was the north end of the docks that drove everything. Liverpool Irish. Well, that's, that's, what I, that's, yeah. what I thought, that's what I've been talking about. That's where about. Larkin, Jim Larkin comes in, yeah. and James Connolly yeah. comes in, even though they're over in Dublin and yeah. Belfast, their influence is still being yeah. felt on the Liverpool. Um, waterfront. The um, in terms of Liverpool's um, African community, um, we haven't included anything of those in the industrial setting. What we had done is come across this wonderful story of a. Uh, a young Liverpool lad called um, Gordon Stratton. He, he later became known, or sorry, his original name. Born in the North End of Liverpool, Irish and African descent. Um, <coughs> and from 1904, he's a clog dancer with Charlie Chaplin in Liverpool. So. What we've called new, the new industrial movement, the new educational movement, the new architectural movement, the new artistic movement, is now joined by another new movement, which is the birth of ragtime. Now, people have said to us, well, how do, how do you equate this young Billy Masters with ragtime? Well, it's quite easy, really. 1911 was when the first ragtime record, uh, uh, Alexander's Ragtime Band, becomes a number one hit in New York. Um, Billy Masters sails out of Liverpool at that time. Chaplin follows him a year later. And by 1920, Billy Masters had introduced jazz into France and Europe. He then took jazz to Buenos Aires, another port city in Latin America, where he fused the jazz floor with uh, Latin American rhythms and forms of dance. So what we've done in our work is we've brought to the service this new history of this individual. He's basically been written out of the book history. Um, but again, we, we would argue you, you you cannot separate that musical movement from all the other movements that are, are um, taking place. Um, in terms of how we look at, um, our work is actually called um, Rhythms of Carry. And what we try to do is apply what took place in 1911 to what took place, what's taking place today. Um, and when you think about it, um, in terms of this group of workers for the first time ever, securing all these new payments for waiting time, working time, overtime, travelling time, all these plethora of payments that these workers had secured for the first time ever. And then compare it to today. Uh, last year the TUC TUC report that work, British workers are now contributing £29 billion 
worth of free labour to British employers by working unpaid overtime. And what's, what's part of that, of course, is this other um, um, generalised um, form of work, which I get very concerned about, volunteerism. You know, Liverpool City Centre now, there's a whole range of artistic, cinematic areas where young kids are working for nothing. Just to be able to say, well, I've worked for that company and I've, I've got that on my, my CV. Um, Liverpool City Centre today, two miles away from the dockside area, is probably the biggest site of female exploitation that we've ever seen in the city. We've got the biggest retail, what's it called, Rich Liverpool? What? Abomination. This <laughs> retail shopping mall. Uh, predominantly staffed by female labour, uh, minimum wage, minimal rights, mass exploitation. So I'm, I'm in the middle of doing this other project at the moment because of um, a lot of these young kids, their working week is over seven days. So you get the same pay for Saturday and Sunday that they get for Monday to Friday. Very similar to what dock workers and seafarers were getting over a hundred years ago. Um, how we make a, an inroad with those young people who work in these areas, what, what I found very, very interesting is that when you speak to them about their working week, and when you speak to them, that w would they like to ha be paid overtime or double time on a Saturday and Sunday? They they grab it at one, you know. They, they get it in one, and it's it's just a pity that um, particular trade unions who organise retail sectors of the economy um, aren't using that argument enough. Because I think there's a massive potential there for um, new forms of uh, representation and new new forms of um, trade unionism as well. Um, the other issue, um, which you mentioned before, is this question of tailorism, time and motion. Um, what we normally do when, we, when we've done this event in Liverpool, we normally show, uh, anyone seen Charlie Chaplin in modern times? Where he's on the, he's on the production line, and he's getting quicker and quicker and quicker, and then he slips off to the toilet for a slight smoke, and then all of a sudden his boss appears, who's, got it on camera and shouts him to go back to work. And the genius of Chaplin with that film is he, he's, he's predicted everything that happens today in terms of surveillance, the pace of work, the labour process that's gone from being collective to individual with the levels of internal surveillance as well. Um, finally, um, What we also came across was, um, I speak every year at the James Larkin um, Memorial Festival in Liverpool, and um, Jim Larkin leaves Liverpool in 1913, goes to New York. 1919, he's prosecuted for criminal anarchy. And he's prosecuted by a very young district attorney by the name of J. Edgar Hoover, who later becomes the head of FBI. So we go James Larkin, J.L., 60 years later, John Lennon, J.L., both being persecuted by this particular individual. Larkin gets jailed for 10 years, ends up in Sing Sing, um, 
He's released after three, never ever the same, by the way, when he is released. Um, but of course, what we, what we wanted to do is trace back to, to see what Larkin was doing to um, um, what, he, what, he, what he'd been up to in America because J. Edgar Hoover called James Larkin the Archangel of Anarchy. Um, and it's fascinating to trace Larkin's steps in New York. Um, and I'm delighted that being in the Hydra bookshop, we came across James Larkin founded, was a co-founder with Lucille Parsons and a group of other assorted uh, anarchistic syndicalists. Uh, Larkin, uh, they founded um, this club in the south side of Chicago called the Dill Pickle. The Dill Pickle was the name of a very popular ragtime tune at the time. Um, and this is the only book that's ever been written about the Dill Pickle. The rise and fall of the Dill Pickle, jazz age in Chicago's wildest, most outrageously creative, hobohemian night spot. Wonderful book. This is a space that's created in Chicago, and it, I, it, this is the best description of it. In its day, the pickle, as most of its um, habitués called it, was regularly packed to full capacity. A rare outpost of free speech, intellectual funhouse, joyful rendezvous of hobos, poets, artists, revolutionaries and various unclassified oddballs. Its poetic and carnivalesque reputation has not only survived, but prospered over the years. Um, that's a great um, depiction of the dill pickle, and I would suggest that that is also a great depiction of what the Hides of Bookshop promises in the future. So thanks a lot for uh, listening to it. Explain why, because what, what was one of the most exciting things about the work you've been doing is uh, the connection between uh, IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, in the States, and, uh, and Liverpool. And there was like, I've been spreading rumours that you know, people, one of my sort of revolutionary heroines, which was Lucy Parsons, had connections with Liverpool. Can you, can you sort of outline where those connections came from, why they appeared, and who was involved in it? Um, first appeared in 1905 when James Connolly, Liverpool Irish, found a member of the IWW. Um, Connolly then is a labour organiser on Brooklyn docks alongside Lucille Parsons. We can't find any track of Lucille Parsons coming to Liverpool, but what we can find track of is this continuing transatlantic influence of the Wobblies. So Big Bill Haywood, from 19, who's the, the figurehead of the Wobblies from 1910 to 1913, is a constant figure in Liverpool. We've got this wonderful photograph of him with, um, alongside James Larkin. And again, uh, a forgotten history, um, 1912, the Secretary of Liverpool Trades Council the councils of all the trade unions was a lady called um, Ma Bamma. And we've got this wonderful photo of her, Larkin and Haywood before Haywood's due to speak at one of these massive big um, labour meetings in the North End of Liverpool. And that continued so that there were actual um, <coughs> branches of the IWW set up in Liverpool. In fact, there was probably more influence of the IWW than there was of conventional Marxism and Socialism. And I think that chimes in with um, the different nature of Liverpool trade unionism. And when I say that, 
I'm not saying it in an arrogant way, I'm just saying that it's a fact of life. That uh, all my trade union life, I don't think I ever was involved in one dispute about wages. Never about wages. It was always about my, my own respective workforce reacting to authority and discipline. And I think that is traced back to the spontane spontaneous nature of um, how the lobby is organised back in, back, in back in those days. Oh, well, uh, how do you think Liverpool uh, in the present day reflects what, what you're saying in the past and how and, and what are how is Liverpool as a city responding to you know what, what this government's doing in terms of cuts and things? Um, so you, and is there organising? Is there historical remnants of organising still there, or is there major organising? What's is there parallels? you know, with what's going on now and then? The Merseyside area has got the highest density of trade unionism than any other part of the country. The Merseyside area has got more trade union leaders and more trade union officials than any other part of the country. And of course, out of the seven or eight big unions within the TUC, six of those leaders are from Liverpool. However, and this is the problem, and this is where I run into um, major differences with my old um, comrades on the left, is that, okay, we can accept that, but you go to the north, the north end, the south end, the east and the west, there are these massive industrial estates that were built just after the Second World War. The industrial estate and the housing estate. Some of them are six or seven miles on the periphery edge of Liverpool. One of them that we're doing a project around now, at its peak, Kirby Industrial Estate provided work for 89% of the housing estate. That figure now is barely 9%. These areas are literally in a land the time is forgotten. <coughs> Young people, two, three generations unemployed. Um, mention Trident to them, you think it's a new computer game. It's a fact. There is no neighbourhood or family connection with trade unionism and radicalism. That has been wiped out. How we reconnect with them? I don't know. I haven't quite got to that. Um, because their lifestyles are very individualistic. Um, their, their collective nature of life is, is minimal. And the, these are the things that I would argue were always very, very important to um, radical politics and radical trade unionism over the centuries, that you had families, neighbourhoods and community, uh, that's where your roots were, and these things got passed on. Um, I don't see that happening anymore. That's what worries me really. So, what is the experience then of Liverpool as a change in city in response to that then? Would you say that, uh, how is that impacting then on a city which has had such a strong history of, you, you know, that like you were just talking about, it, would you say that that's now in decline? Well, I don't think it's reacting very well to it because I, 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 I was speaking to Mark and Roger about it. Uh, again, part of this project that I'm involved in it's looking at this whole question of what's called a post-industrial city. That's, you know, um, Liverpool, and somebody said it's the same with Bristol to a great degree, because the industry, skilled and semi-skilled, is gone. The city decides, well, we've got to go for leisure and tourism to bring people into the city 
began to describe the movie. Um, what we're seeing in Liverpool at the weekend now, over a 48 hour cycle, is something that I've never ever seen before. Um, where the city literally becomes colonised by hen nights and stag parties from all over the country. Uh, over a 48 hour cycle. What goes along with that, which is something that we've never seen in Liverpool, is a uh, rise of lap dancing, strip clubs, and what's linked to that is this appalling violence, male on female, that goes on every weekend. Um, I would argue that's what you get when you sell your soul to tourism, consumerism. That's what it generates. So, no, it's not, it's not living up to its past heritage very well, I'm afraid. Um, and that's because no, no one's coming up with any answers, you see. Um, what about the large population of, uh, well, transient population of students? The large population, transient, transient, transient students. Um, well, I've been out leafleting for UCU the last month and um, I find it hard to equate with what I see on it when I'm le out leafleting trade union wise with people who seem to think that students are going to be storming the Winter Palace next. Uh, don't I see it. Don't I, I don't think, see it at all. I, said, I'm, I was thinking more along the lines of uh, I remember a few, probably about five years ago. There was uh, the, the councillors from Everton, from Everton were requesting that no more students um, residences be built in Everton because the population had just become too seasonal. And uh, uh, in the summer, because there were no students there, the population of Everton plummeted. And it, I was thinking more of the effect right. of the traditions of Liverpool as having a unique kind of identity has changed because a lot of the population is there for three years and they're bugger off and they're not rooted in, in the city as much. But what, like I must have been, what they have brought with them and what, what you're tending to see now is that. Um, they are regenerating parts of the city that were dying with the birth of Liverpool Wall and the big shopping precinct. Um, the outside, uh, some of the outlying streets, which are some of Liverpool's oldest shopping, where um, when Roger and some of the group came up to news from nowhere, that's one of the oldest streets, Old Street. They're undergoing some kind of rejuvenation now through the student population and others who feel totally excluded by the conventional consumerism and so no I would welcome students Rich. I think there's a bit of an illusion about when you're talking about um, you know the fragmentation of working class community and and culture and stuff as a result of what's happened over perhaps over the last 30 years. I think it's important to realise this is often talked, it's kind of romanticised a lot of the, I mean obviously that there's a material basis to those connections in you know working class community or whatever in, in, in for many hundreds of years but I mean that, you know reading anything about British history teaches you one thing which is that the working class has never had a stable community like you talk you know I mean like if you look at like if you read The Making of the English Working Class which I definitely recommend and if you read that book and you, or you know, other books who talk about it, the history of working class in Britain is constant disruption and movement and dynamics because, you know, I mean, you know, people talk about the, the collapse of, say, Welsh mining communities after the end of the miners' strike. Well, those communities were created by disruption. Yeah. You know, they, you know, working class, you know, we, we react or even are ahead of the game sometimes in terms of what's going on in those communities. We create those things. But the point is, there's always been disruption. So it's not, I know, I mean, it's a bleak, pretty bleak picture, and I think it is a bleak picture, but it was a bleak picture in 1825, it was a bleak picture in 1850, it was a bleak picture in 1932, when there was, you know, 
kind of boy marches down this very street getting yeah, attacked by the police. It's, there's always been this this need, you know, the, 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 you know, the idea of working class community being stable for like hundreds of years is really quite an, an illusion, I think. No, what I don't, um, you see, I, what I would argue to counter that much is that Marxism and every other type of ism would say, uh, revolutionary consciousness, all that type of thing is caused by masses of workers all being under the one roof and forging this collective consciousness. Where are all these masses of workers all under the one roof? Well, that's because we haven't got a manufacturing industry. We don't have a manufacturing industry, but what do we have in its place? Very, very individualised forms of working. So, my nephew has just walked out to Sony, he was there for seven years, put him on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Because he's working at a computer terminal all day, he's not allowed to speak to people on either side of him. And during his break in the <coughs> time, times of socialising, that's frowned upon because they, they give them individual games and all this type of thing to now I find that type of thing very very scary you see because again that's just another element of this individualization and what can you call it alienation from the social you know from sociability and social life in general and I don't think we've quite got a, a handle on how to deal with that at the moment I also think that I come from the Forest of Dean and I grew up in Sinsbury, which is a small mining town. Now, when my dad, when I talked to my dad, he said there was like, there was like 45 pubs in Sinsbury, a population of 10,000 people, right? But I just went back this weekend and one of the, like, there's probably about six now, and one of them is just shut down, so there's probably five. There was a miners' welfare hall, which is on its last legs. There was huge amounts of community resource where people interacted and all that. I mean, I'm not saying pubs are obviously the best place, but that, that whole community, sense of community and community interaction is being eroded by, you know, look, look, if you took, took pubs as an example, you know, you have bars, you don't have areas where people go sit there particularly, you don't have communities based around the, these community centres or you know all this stuff is gone. I mean I remember in the early 90s I used to work in a community resource centre in Sinford and we used to have things with one in Kirby That's right. and, and they were like sort of one model of re-engaging with, with communities but there's nothing. I, I'll go back to Sinford. There's no leisure. There's nothing. It's fucked. I mean it's a dormitory town. There, there's no young people. Or, or, there's no employer. And there's no and there's no community space anymore. All, all that community space is gone. And if you, you can even look at Bristol, you see it all the time. Community what, places which were once maybe religious even or you know community spaces, and they they just been commodified and they're gone. So where do people meet? You know they don't. And I think that that's a sign of this individualism as well. You know where you know people sit at home drinking. It's too expensive to go to the pub, or it's like their pubs aren't there anymore. Whereas you know, this lack of solidarity is very difficult, I think, to achieve now because because there is nowhere, you know, really, where people just interact on a normal day-to-day -day basis and sit around going, oh, actually, we're shit, you know, or <laughs> if you thought about that, that's gone. That doesn't happen. Has that not just been, has that not just migrated to the internet? Because it's a whole virtual, not for younger generation, but there's a whole network of communities. No, actually, it doesn't compare. I know it's not the same, but if people, yeah. people still need to feel a sense of community and connecting, it's just they're using I think the thing with the now. online community is just that people choose who they they interact with. It's not like a normal community where you have a mix of different yeah. ages and different people. Yeah. You, it's, um, so identity communities. Really. So yeah. it's still lovely when you meet up, meet yeah. with people that you yeah. normally communicate with online, based <laughs> in a physical space. Yeah, and have a few beers. It's a bit of the difference between sex and porn, really. Where's the mythological community? Where's the mythological community? Where's the 
community where everybody interact, interacted when it existed. It existed. And uh, you know, if you look at lots of communities, lots of communities, and I can remember going to a village actually where Desmond Tutu was actually a, uh, a chaplain for a time in, in Surrey, and it became very clear to me that this tiny little village was stratified into a, you know, a middle class which was focused around the around the Church of England and a working class which was focused around uh, around the Methodist Church and so on. And never the twain, never the twain meet. The twain meet. And, and same in the same sense thing. So, so I think we have to be thinking the real problem is that the, the people who are workless are desperately que effectively queuing for a, li for a living and can, cannot even afford to, to, you know, to go out and, um, you, know, you know, even if you go in, in you know, sometimes mm -hmm. when I'm feeling a bit tight and, and just go and have a half. You know, that, that's still a quick 50. That's a quick 50 you've only got if you want to pick your people in benefits. I, I, I totally agree about this definition of the community. I, I, I mean, you know, this idea of like community, you know, you know there's a community in this area, oh, there's a community, I think mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, a lot of critiques of this have gone on, but I mean, the point is, and, and there is massive divisions. I mean, it sort of came up in the riots in August, you know, we're all the community, we're attacking on the community. No, what, what do you mean, my community? Like these, you know, a load of business people around here, they're my community, or are they not? Like, you know, so this idea that this is unified to me is ridiculous. As you said, there's, there's the class divisions throughout the whole of this. You know, there's people who own businesses, people who have got no work, there's people who don't own anything, there's people who own you know, mad, massive houses who live somewhere else. But the point is, there is you, you can't just dismiss that immediately and say, well, you know, we're totally individualised. There will always be a human need for sex rather than porn, right? So, if you see what I mean. Okay, so there, there is a human need for that. I don't believe the internet will ever replace that human need, right? And there will be a battle. The question is: is how is that human need for community, for social social life ever going to realise itself in a time when that's being reduced into in practice into the internet? What's going to happen? And I'll see. And I would say you'll see all sorts of weird shit going on in the next 20, 30 years. It's be really interesting. I think you're going to get stuff like the equivalent of stuff like football hooliganism, right? Which most people misunderstood really because that provides excitement and action and. and the escape from boredom of work.